Thank you so much for coming to Cracky Symposium 3. Oh, that sushi looks good. I didn't have lunch today. Um, my name's Liam D. Elysiums. I'm the co-founder of Pracky Productions. And uh, I'm also a master's student here at UQ. And I work at uh, Brisbane Boys College uh, boarding house as well. Um, what we're going to be doing today is something quite interesting, something quite unique, I think. And that's to support pre-service teachers within Brisbane and to promote a community. Now, I remember my very, very, very first PRAC and I still had spots on my face from my school graduation. <laughs> Yet here I was walking into a classroom and suddenly I'm the authority figure. And it was daunting to say the least. And it turned out to be the most fantastic learning experience and I'm still in education today, but it got off to a rocky start and this is what happened. My very first class that I was supposed to teach actually wasn't supposed to teach. It was my first day and my mentor teacher was away on a panel and they said, I'm away on a panel, I can't come with you, but why don't you go see our class with a substitute teacher? Now this will be good for you because you're kind of on the same level as a substitute teacher as a pre-service teacher. So you'll be able to get to see how you, our students react to you. And I thought, oh, that's all right. It was just an observationary practice. I was just supposed to be in my weird little corner away from the kids, just observing. Now, when I rocked up, the kids were absolutely everywhere. There'd been a fight at lunch. Someone took someone else's rugby ball. It was chaos. And it took a few good minutes to actually get them in two straight lines. And the substitute teacher rocked up. Now, this guy was probably about 150, 152 years old. <laughs> he had a hump back. He had the ugliest, like, Cosby sweater, unsarcastically on. He had hair coming out of his nose, his ears, and he barely spoke English. And he rocked up, and I had my resources, because a good little practice student, had my resources up with me. And I said, yeah, I'm a teacher, but I'm a student teacher. I'm only here to observe. Now, I think the only word he understood was teacher, because he went, oh, okay, gave me all the resources and walked off. <laughs> I didn't know where student services were. I didn't know what classes were near me. I didn't know who to ring, who to call. And I turned around to see 30 grade seven students just looking up at me. And it, I went into fight or flight. I did. But I went, all right, kids, I'm your teacher for today. In you come. And I looked down at the resources I'd been given for that day, and it was about a paragraph long on persuasive speaking. Now, these are grade sevens. Those of you that know the curriculum know this is the first time they've ever done persuasive speaking. And I was going to be the one to introduce them to this brand new world of English literature. And I milked that paragraph for all it was worth. I worked sentence by sentence. I got them into groups. I said, you know what, kids? You teach me. What do you know? Let's go to prior knowledge. And it was probably the worst class you've ever seen, but I eventually got through it. Now, what happened was, after that period I had to spare, I was walking back to the staff room, and I saw another PRAC student of mine walking off with this same substitute teacher from before. Now, unbeknownst to me, he went off and did the exact same thing to the other PRAC student, and he got left. Now, afterwards, after I decompressed, I luckily had a support network. My mentor teacher was quite good. I've got a few teachers in the family and a few teachers that I'd luckily met through uni. So I was able to kind of put that in context. Now this guy that was with me didn't have that support network. And the next day he dropped out and he never came back. In fact, he was found crying in the bathrooms afterwards. Now the importance of this story is communication communication on multiple different levels because I'm the type of person, if I didn't have communication with other teachers, I would have been the one at one o'clock in the morning going it over in my head again and again and again. And my little brain, just as about I'm about to doze off going, hey Liam, you know that horrible lesson you had today? I went, yeah. I was just looking at your uh, lesson plan that you had for your mentor teacher tomorrow and uh, it seems you're doing the exact same thing. I wonder how that's gonna go for you. Sweet dreams. <laughs> and I'd never get a wink of sleep again. But this communication that I had helped me, it saved me. And for the rest of the prac, I had a fantastic time. I had a great learning experience. And uh, I'm still in education today. 
But for many, it's too much. They have those career-ending mistakes on practicum experience. And it says that upwards of 52% of teachers in Australia drop out within the first five years of their careers, which is why I started Pracky. I thought, why does it have to be like this? Why does it have to be the chosen few? Why can't we all have these support networks? Why can't we get these communications between university and what we're doing at the moment and experts in the field? Which is why Pracky started. Now Pracky is made with pre-service teachers for pre-service teachers and the purpose of it is to connect you with experts in the field and to stop those nervous feelings, those budding questions in your minds that you may have before you go out on prac, before you go out to your first job, before you go out to experience in the field. Now I find lectures are quite big. They talk about meta problems within the education industry. Yeah, I, all I wanted to know was why do my lessons keep going 15 minutes short even though I have a million documents? How do I create, how do I even get a job interview? How do I make sure my prac goes well? Now this is what's gonna happen today. You're gonna get the experience to ask some of the best educational experts in the country any question that you want, anything that you're worried about within education, you can fire away. Now we're gonna be doing this in a few different ways, but without further ado, I'll introduce to you the expert panel that we have here for you today that will be asking you those questions. So can we welcome them as they come up onto stage? Thank you very much. So first of all, um, my name is Liam Dealissiums, as I stated at the beginning. Um, I'm a master's student here at UQ doing a thesis on supporting pre-service teachers. I also work as a resident tutor at the Brisbane Boys College Boarding House. And uh, I'm a currently a research uh, assistant at QUT. First here we have Mr. Louis Bradfield. Louis is the principal and founder of Maridati Early Childhood Community Schools. Next team we have Miss Elizabeth Ward, the an English and so secondary teacher at Brisbane Boys College. We've got Mr. Scott Harding, an English French teacher from Springfield Anglican College. Mr. Adam Wood, a humanities teacher at BBC, also a tutor at UQ and a member of the Australian Army Reserve. Mrs. Melinda Pratt, an early childhood specialist teacher from St. Peter's Lutheran College. And at the end we have Mr. Lou Pauger, executive principal of Kelvin Grove State College. So for the first half of this event, I'm going to be, if you've ever seen Parkinson, <laughs> it's basically an academic version of Parkinson. I'll be asking these, um, the panel a question on the elected passion area because I believe it's important that teachers, when they come out and they talk to young teachers coming into the field, that they talk about something they're truly passionate about. So first of all, I'll be asking uh, Mr. Louis Bradfield, just to give you a bit more background information on Louis. Louis is the founder and principal of Maridati Early Childhood Community Schools in Toowoomba. Maridati currently enrolls 85 children from kindergarten to year six, and is currently looking to expand into Ipswich, Brisbane, and Mackay. Maridati is a Swahili word meaning to embellish or enhance, and was chosen to reflect the school's ethos in positioning children at the center of all decision-making. 2019 is Louis's 31st year with Maridati, and his work continues to challenge traditional ideas about what schools and children should, quote unquote, look like, with Maridati resisting pressures of national normalization and standardization. So Louis, to get the ball rolling, when you talked, uh, when we were talking in the, the making of this symposium, you elected to talk about the word emotion, and it continually pops up as you're part of your overall strategy particularly with the emotional development of your students. Why do you believe that this is unique to Maridati? Wouldn't you agree that all schools are attempting to address the needs of children's emotional development in their own ways? Why do you think this is a fight that's worth fighting? And what do you think Maridati does that's so different to other schools? So where to start? Um, so uh, to answer one of your questions, no, I don't think the schools um, actually do that, that work. Um, I think it's increasingly more important that we do. So if I start at the beginning, the ethos itself, there's two main or broad themes we, we play with. One is self and the other is thought. 
and how basically thought feeds that process of developing self and becoming. And what we're finding and increasingly that children, you know, if children are going to access learning, they actually need um, to be able to learn to navigate their emotions. Um, and we're seeing increasingly in schools, you know, first and foremost, uh, leading international nations don't start formal education until children are seven. In Australia, we're starting to push that at the age of three and four, which in my, and from what I know, is ridiculous. So we're actually seeing children quite young being quite suppressed, a lot of structure, a lot of order, a lot of adults actually almost imposing, you know, the way things should look on children. So from quite early on, children, I, I don't think, are almost encouraged to suppress emotion rather than to express it. And in that, it's, it's quite a minefield of things. So it's quite difficult to talk to in such a short period of time. But um, if, you know, the idea that children should be seen and not heard, it's an old idea. But look, it's, it's, it's becoming increasingly so. And I think these, the rigidity and the structure and the order of these early childhood systems is actually getting to the point they're out of control. And research is showing us that children are struggling emotionally. We're seeing high levels of anxiety, high levels of depression. Uh, recent stats looking at how many children are actually on antidepressants under the age of five which is really quite alarming, I think. And, and so the work we're doing and the work we're doing on emotion is because we think, and the latest neuroscience talks to, you know, what's happening for children during those early years. And, and so we think it's important that, we're, that we support them to understand and to navigate that, to access their learning. Um, and to support that at Maradati, we, so for people to enroll their children at Maradati, they need to agree to walk with us. So we're challenging the whole idea that you drop your child over the fence, we'll fix it, and then we'll send it back. And so there's this almost disownership of responsibility by parents at Maradadi, they need to walk with us. And so in order to do that, and to support them to parent, we prioritize, we bring consultants in, and we support them to parent. Because the other thing that we're doing, which is, you know, and stats are showing this, is that this traditional approach, approach to parenting is not working either. So children, and we know, I'm not blaming schools for that either, society's changing, it's shifting. The world looks different. You know, childhood looks different. And so um, what we're actually working with, and these parents know that they want to do it differently, but no one's talking about it. We're still holding on to these ideas, and schools are notorious for it. You know, they rank children, they rate them, you know, they, 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 they test them, they put all this pressure on this relationship between adult and child because almost schools blame parents that something that they've done has actually created this child. And I think it just doesn't make sense. So if we're prioritizing well-being, which leads directly, I think, to that emotional stuff, then we need the parents to walk with us. Thank you, Louis. So just a reminder, you can ask questions throughout the entirety of this event by following the QR code on the sheet that you've been given or putting in the link so Louis, um, coming from a stance of alternative education, so if you want to ask him, him about finding the right school for you or challenging current ideals within schools, um, he would be a fantastic person to ask questions about that, especially if you're coming from a primary um, early childhood stance as well. So next we have uh, Miss Elizabeth Ward. To give you a bit more background information on Elizabeth. Elizabeth graduated from UQ, so UQ alumni here. Uh, and 2015 has been working at Brisbane Boys College since 2016. She teaches senior English and geography, has recent ta recently uh, taken on the role of middle school housemaster and is the 2IC of the college's Amnesty International Club and is regularly involved with their co-curricular activities. Her key area of interest is finding her own unique pedagogy as a new teacher. And it's fu funny you should say new pedagogy, Elizabeth, because I think it's important as important as it is to hear from educational leaders, I think it's very valuable also to hear from boots on the ground, early career teachers as well. And Elizabeth, you've kind of bucked the trend a little bit. I know when I was graduating, there was a lot of rhetoric around rural placements, about the public sector, and that basically, if you were a young teacher, you had to go out to Mount Isa to get any sort of permanent contract. And that getting anything permanent within Brisbane was difficult, especially in the private system. Yet, you're in your first few years of your career and you've had, um, you're now you've got a full-time position at Brisbane Boys College, one of the largest GPS, GPS schools in Brisbane. What would you say to someone that said that copying that would be unrealistic 
what tips could you share to these young teachers in the audience to emulate uh, your career progression? How, how have you got to this stage? Apply for anything and everything. If you think, oh, I couldn't go for that job, they wouldn't want me, you don't know the situation that's going on at that school. Someone could quit tomorrow, they might need someone and your resume could be at the top of the pile. So no matter what, always send in your resume. I remember there were a few schools I saw and I thought, oh no, they wouldn't be interested in a first year teacher, I have no experience, ignore that. Um, even just sending in your resume, go to the school's website, um, look for their HR email and just send it in and then they've got it on file. As I said, someone could quit, your name could come up first. Um, the other bit of advice I'd give you as well is that during PRAC, and I know you've probably been told this a lot, but it's true, network as much as you can. Go to anything and everything your PRAC school is offering, put your hand up for everything, offer to help with resources, ask people for opinions on your resources, then maybe they'll like them and they'll see you as a person who could be helpful for them. Just do everything you can. Yeah, fantastic. So if you want to ask a question about particularly finding your footing, especially as a young teacher, Elizabeth would have some fantastic um, advice on that. So next to Elizabeth is Mr. Scott Harding. So to give you a bit of background information on Scott, Scott's currently the senior English and French teacher at Springfield Anglican College. Scott has 22 years experience working across public, private and independent schools in the UK and in Australia. Scott's previously been the 2IC at Brisbane's largest GPS schools and also the president of Springfield United Football Club and is a passionate coach of football and cricket, solidifying his reputation as an expert in pastoral education. This care for the students has extended to the tertiary level, with Scott being the other co-founder of Pracky Productions. Um, Scott has a strong belief in sending the elevator back down, so to speak, and supporting young pre-service teachers. Now, it's quite interesting, Elizabeth, you might talk about this in the future. Uh, you teach at a single sex school. Now, Scott, I always call you the all-rounder, because you've worked in every background, every type of school imaginable. And I think something interesting for you is you've worked in a co-educational and a single sex school. And the question that was buzzing around my head when you, you were um, confirmed on this panel is supporting young boys and young girls of equal value within the same classroom. Now, especially in grades seven, eight, nine, when the estrogen and the testosterone hits them like a freight train, I think young boys and young girls need different things at different times. Maybe they don't. If you have boys and girls within the same classroom, do you, does that change your pedagogy, especially in those puberty hitting ages? Do you think, have you seen uh, results, for example, where one gender rises and another stagnates? And does that even factor into your thinking? Good question. Um, <clears throat> firstly, I just want to preface by saying one of the reasons I'm teaching in a, in a co-educational um, environment is my daughter's now in year eight at the school that I'm at. So it was always a question of um, knowing your enemy, as it were, <laughs> before you started to teach them. Um, obviously, I don't teach her, but obviously it was, I was very aware then when I first came in from a, an all-boys environment, which I was at at BBC and obviously with my previous schools, that I had to start again from ground zero, almost like a prac student. You know, I never taught girls before six, seven years ago. And so when you first come in, you try a few different tactics and you, you try a few of the things that, that may have worked for you previously and they don't work. They just do not work. And you go, okay, well, I've learned, I've learned a hard lesson there. You never stop learning that. And so what you have to do is be quite subtle in terms of the variations you may or may not use in the classroom. So particularly when you're using something that's relatively contentious, um, we look at, for instance, um, currently we're studying um, rabbit-proof fence on the curriculum in year eight, which is quite young to be doing that. When we talk about sensitive issues in the classroom, very often you will get different range of reactions. Some of the boys, for instance, aren't always the most enlightened in terms of their um, answers that they're giving. And so then you can get an emotional reaction to that and you have to manage that. And, and probably anticipate it before it even happens would be, would be the best way. So prevention, an answer prevention is better than a ton of cure, you know? Um, one of the other things that's really interesting too in my school environment currently is that the girls are obviously in year eight outperforming the boys quite extensively in English. Now obviously some of the curriculum activities you choose may favor them a little bit more, some may favor the boys. The honest truth is you try to incorporate everything. So a bit of movement in the classroom is very important. I think this idea that Louis talking about with social well-being, it's not good for young teenage boys to just be stuck behind a desk all the time. 
It really isn't. And I think we're becoming a little bit more enlightened about that as we go through the um, the gears here in education in Australia. And certainly with, the, I suppose, if you will, the range of texts that are going to be on the senior curriculum that they will end up experiencing. They need to be aware of the fact that, one, there's different perspectives of their own out there, but two, also that, you know, we do allow a certain amount of flexibility within the classroom for the way that you, the way that you teach. And that's a really important lesson for you when you first start teaching on PRAC. Don't be afraid to be a little bit experimental if you can be. You know, try things, mix them up. If you make a mistake, it's okay. The sun will rise tomorrow, you know? It's a question of learning from that experience. It's a question of learning from that and going, well, okay, well, that worked quite well with this class, perhaps not well with the other class. I've got two year eight classes, very, very different personalities. And not just because they're boys and girls mixed up, it's just the chemistry of the room. You can have one or two students away and suddenly the whole chemistry of the room changes. It might be you get them in the afternoon. It might be that there's wind outside. They're like horses. They spook. You know? They get spooked. It's like having a horse whisper. You know? It just depends. And very often it's a question of, of reading that room. I think that's the best way I can answer that. You know what I mean? I'm sure it would be the same in Maradani. You know? I'm very sure. And it's a question of having that, that open mind. You know? I'm not going, well, they're boys. They're not going to like doing this. They're girls. They're not going to like doing that. Because there are some girls that actually, te- you know, behave like a stereotypical boy and vice versa. You can't, you can't necessarily assign it that way. It's more a question of learning, looking at the individual student, I'd suggest, and <clears throat> looking at what really intrigues them. You know, that'd be my advice. So if you want to ask about the intricacies of pedagogy, the day-to-day runnings of a classroom, I think Scott's experience, he's your man for that. If you've got those little itty-bitty questions where you think, eh, I don't really, that doesn't really come up in a unit, that's kind of up in a lecture, Scott is the best man to ask for that. So next up, we've got uh, Mr. Adam Wood. So Adam's been teaching, uh, started his teaching career in 2002 and is currently a highly accomplished teacher at Brisbane Boys College in their humanities department. Uh, at BBC, Adam's been the outdoor education coordinator and is currently the boarding house master. Along with Adam's teaching, he is a member of the Australian Army Reserve as a part of the junior leadership team within the 9th Battalion of the Royal Queensland Regiment at the Inogra Barracks. As an infantry soldier, he's been deployed on operational service to the Solomon Islands to rifle company Butterworth in Malaysia, along with humanitarian work during the 2011 floods in uh, southeast Queensland. Adam has a passion for inquiry-based learning pedagogy and is currently completing a thesis on how to implement it in geography fieldwork in secondary schools. So Adam, with your teaching, with your experience in the army and also with a young family, the phrase work-life balance comes to mind, just a smidge. How have you been able to um, handle that? Because I think with young teachers, young teachers especially are notorious for overloading themselves, for burning themselves out, um, so to speak. What tips can you give uh, to a young teacher about um, uh, improving their work-life balance? And has this ever been a particular struggle for you? Uh <laughs> Yeah, last night. Um, <laughs> yesterday, uh, so Mondays are my boarding house days. So I start at uh, quarter to seven in the morning and uh, go through to 11 o'clock at night. So I have roughly yesterday 45 minutes. Period two was my time off. So I taught five periods yesterday. I was on duty before school, recess, lunchtime. Um, I came over here for a meeting at four o'clock. Uh, with one of the subjects that I tutor. I went back, I started boarding at 5.30, I worked through to 11, um, and then I slept on the couch in the tutor's kitchen last night, so I didn't go home. So I woke up this morning at six o'clock, had a shower in the staff toilets, went to uh, our house photographs are on today. So so the boarding house did theirs at 7.30 this morning. And then I went and taught at quarter past eight did the first period, had a period off, then came over here. So in a 24-hour period, I didn't see my family. I spoke to them once on the phone and probably haven't stopped, I'd say, um, during that time. I don't really like the term work-life balance. Um, it's something I said to Liam, I don't really want to talk about work-life balance. I just want to talk about life balance. And that's what you've got to try and find is you've got to find that balance in your life that you don't want 
the work aspect of it when you come to work and work those six or seven hours a day to be um, a chore and a, a task to do. You want to enjoy it. And yesterday, five periods, first day back of term, I had every single class, I had my five classes, but every single class was different. Every single person threw something different at me. There was uh, the things that we got on email, the things that we got, we verbally talked to other staff members about, it was just non-stop for the day. But you don't want that to be a chore. You don't want that to be something where you go home and then go, ugh, that was, you know, it really eat me up inside. It was something where you just go, that's just part of my life. I just do that for six or seven hours a day and then you disappear and do something else. And for me, I enjoy doing things. I like doing other things. That's why I like coming over here to UQ and, and tutoring during the semester. Uh, and I've done military service for 23 years now. So there's never been a time where I've sort of stopped not wanting to do that or found that a chore. I actually enjoy it when I go away outfield. Um, it gets me time off from work and the family as well. So it's always good to go outfield. Uh, and, and doing things that are of, of interest to you, I really encourage people to, to do things that when you step out of the, the schoolyard at 3 o'clock or 3.30, 4 o'clock, you want to go and do something that you enjoy doing. You don't want to be taking your work home with you. You want to leave that behind. Get, get yourself a, almost like an office hours. Come in at 7.30, do an hour before school, go and teach your classes, finish at the end of the day maybe do another hour and then just leave it and then walk out and then do your thing. Now, whether it be a family, whether it be an interest, a hobby, a sport you might still play, whatever it is, you need to have something that's going to have that balance across your 24-hour period and try and keep sleep to a minimum and wait until the end of term and then you'll be fine. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. So if you want to talk about the day-to-day -day survival of um, early career teaching, uh, with your other commitments as well. Just a reminder, you can ask any question you like through the forum. We've got some questions running in at the moment and you can ask throughout the whole entirety of this and I can uh, ask on your behalf as well. Um, next, we have uh, Mrs. Melinda Pratt. Melinda is currently an early childhood specialist teacher at St. Peter's Lutheran College and has 25 years experience in education. Melinda worked abroad for 16 years in the UK, designing new curriculums for pre-prep independent schools. She also was involved in developing a cross-phase assessment system in large independent girls' school in London to better monitor student progress. Melinda has been a deputy head and a director of studies, has worked on the QCAA Consistency of Teacher Judgment Project, and is currently completing a Master's of Education at UQ. Melinda values collaboration, using new ICT, and utilising evidence-based pedagogy within the classroom. So, Melinda, in your bio, um, you mentioned evidence-based pedagogy. Um, for pre-service teachers in the audience, maybe that's early on within their course, uh, could you explain what this is in, in layman's terms and tell us how a young teacher could take advantage of things such as formative, summative assessment, data, evidence, statistics, elements like that in their classroom? Because when, when I started my Bachelor of Ed, I didn't know half of these things existed. So how could someone earlier in their career engage with elements like that to improve their teaching? Well, I guess um, I would first of all say that you're in a great position because you are receiving the up-to-date information and research into education and how children learn. Um, I think someone's already mentioned about the brain development and that there's such a wealth of information about how children learn best. And I guess as a teacher, um, and you've probably heard this before, we very um, easily slip into how we've been taught um, and we remember how we have learnt. But actually, um, as Lee was saying, as you stood in front of your classroom for the first time as a PRAC student and you're like, what do I do? How do I approach this? And even though I've taught for 25 years, I am still passionate about finding about the best way to teach something, especially to young children. Um, I'm very similar to um, Louis on the end there where I like to observe what children do and I very much stand back and have a look at what they're doing. And I guess the assessment project that I did in the UK was very much about working with teachers to be very observant about ch um, children in their class, knowing exactly where they are and understanding the children 
Um, yes, you've got the curriculum. Yes, you've got policies. Yes, you've got admin expectations as a teacher. But actually knowing your students and knowing, okay, this is what they can do and, and this is where their passions and interests lie and how you can tap into that and where you're going to take them next and how you can interact with them and engage them to further their learning and progress. So I guess that's a lot about um, evidence-based pedagogy is basically about understanding what works and what doesn't work. Um, uh, I work in an inquiry-based environment and I love to be able to look at um, all the research that looks at um, how curiosity and wonder really um, hooks children as learners um, and for me I start at those places rather than looking at the subjects I have to teach or a text that might be useful or what the Australian curriculum says yes that's important but you have children right in front of you and you have to um, engage with them and understand how their brain works, how their development works, how their emotions are working. Um, and they do come to school with lots of different um, experiences. They might have had a bad breakfast or they've had some sort of issue outside. I'm working with really young children, so that's um, just to give you an understanding of where my comments are coming from. But it's important that, uh, that I guess you really understand um, your children and how they learn best. Thank you, Melinda. So if you want to ask about that side of education, it's something that I'm engaging with through my master's that I didn't really give too much thought about, but it's quite a massive part of education. So I think if you want to ask some questions Melinda's way, that'd be fantastic. So at the end, we have Mr. Lou Pauger. So Lou Pauger is currently the executive principal of Kelvin Grove State College, which is an inner city P-12 school of 3,400 students. Lou's also an executive member and treasurer of the Queensland Secondary Principals Association, which represents over 500 school leaders across the state. Lou was also previously the principal of Red Bank Plains State High and has had leadership positions at Woodcrest State College and Sunnybank State High School. Lou has a passion for school leadership, which has led him to travel all around the world to leading education nations such as Finland, Singapore, Italy, America and Japan to create communities and partnerships back in Australia. Lou has also a passion for health and PE, coaching volleyball up to a national level. So Lou, I think this is a really uh, a great time to, uh, have you <laughs> to have you on the panel because um, I, th I think one could be forgiven in calling the current state of young teachers in Australia a quote-unquote national crisis. With the te where everyone talks about the teacher drought, especially in Queensland, um, you always hear the number 52% of young teachers dropping out. How does this affect you as a school leader? I know you talk about a lot about um, creating communities within your schools and teacher well-being. Does this affect you as a leader and what do you do to put steps into place to support your young student, uh, student teachers? Um, we create a community where happiness and wellness for everyone in the community is what we talk about all the time. Um, you guys are in an amazing um, opportunity in that the, the shortage of teachers around the world is at a crisis level. Uh, the, the way the system responds to how we support you in your early years of teaching will make a difference about whether you become um, old and crusty like some of us out here. No, apologies, uh, apologies. Liz, you're very young. Very young. Um, and and have a wonderful career out of it because I get up and go to work every day absolutely energised and amazed at what happens in the classrooms every day and, and I talk about the magic that happens. It's my job to make sure the magic can happen. Um, the college, this year we have 240 teaching staff, next year we'll have about 270. Uh, so we, we start about 30 teachers, new teachers, a lot of them are first years, um, every year for the last three years. So our, uh, our induction processes are absolutely vital to making sure that we set you up to be successful. And uh, the, the attention we, we pay to that um, around creating an environment where you know, the passion, the, the enthusiasm, the, the, the brilliance that you all possess in your own way um, can be operationalised um, to, to its best um, potential in the classroom. The, 
the thing that is quite unique about Kelvin Grove um, as opposed to other schools around is that we don't play in the metric space. Um, education around the world has been um, crippled by metrics, by politicians who pay attention to metrics that don't mean much, but they use it to justify whatever their, their bent is. So we don't talk about OPs. We don't talk about NAPLAN, not in front of the students. We actually talk about that in, in the staff, in uh, you know my leadership team, etc. We pay attention to it there, but we don't burden students with that um, a, a metric as a as a basic measure. Our our mantra is our goal is not to be better than anyone else. Our goal is to be better than we were yesterday. So it's a growth mindset. It's really simple. It uh, you know in in our community, and I'm sure the communities that are rep represented here. The kids get enough pressure from home around being, you know, the best, um, you know, high achieving, performing, etc. We just want them to be incrementally better, and after 13 years of incrementally better, they're amazing, and they can do whatever they want. And I recount a, a, a conversation I had with two parents who interrogated me for 45 minutes um, at an open day two years ago about where they should bring, whether they should bring their year seven child to the college. Um, and where we are at Kelvin Grove, we've got a variety of schools around us. We're in an inner city community. Um, and so parents have choice. And uh, after the 45 minutes of interrogation about why they should bring, um, why they should choose Kelvin Grove, and, and I wasn't pushing that at all. I was just telling them what we do. Um, it's up to them to make the decision about what best suits their child. Um, and they said, right, so what's your final pitch? And I said, well, the most important thing to me is that your child at the end of year 12, I'll give him back to you well. And they recoiled because I didn't quote some metric that the Korean Mail quotes. I said, if he is well, then the magic that happens in the classroom every day and the co-curricular and the extracurricular programs that are offered, he will have flourished and be an amazing young man but he will be well, and that's what we stand by. Iron not ironically, um, but pleasingly, in the last four years, the, the metrics that we do pay attention to um, are all you know, on a very steep pitch on improvement. But we don't share that in courier mail tables. We just share that with our community because they're our clients. Um, you know, we, we report to them and say, oh, well, NAPLAN's done. Um, and you know, when we get the results, we say, oh, we had a good year at NAPLAN, and that's it. But it's not a constant narrative. Can I just touch on, um, and I really like you know, Louis's um, issue around that, you know, the, the, the preparing, and I, I understand you know, we're not alternate because we're doing what you're doing, I believe. We're trying to create um, students ready for a world that is constantly evolving. The irony is we work in systems that don't evolve. You know, our systems um, by, by their nature tend to be default systems to, to do what we've always done. Yet one of the things that I, I try and build in my leadership space is, is the, the freedom to innovate and be as creative as possible. And we had a retreat recently where we did a bit of a review about where we'd been in the last four years and where we wanted to go. And the music to my ears, and I was talking with one of my mentors this morning, the music to my ears at that time was that my leaders stood up and said, we know it's safe for us to innovate and fail. And we do that regularly to make sure that we're actually pushing boundaries and making sure that we are preparing students for what's next, not what's already happened. So um, it's an amazingly creative space to play in. Um, and my leaders know it's safe and they, they know they'll be supported. You as young teachers, hopefully you'll go into a situation where it is inevitable that you will try things and they will fail. That's how we learn. The ultimate irony, we talk to kids about, we want you to try and fail. Yet we're all terrified to do it ourselves. So, you know, so long as there's no limbs lost or um, lives lost in the process, um, it's what, what do we learn, what we do next? from that failure and what have we learned and, and how we, we leverage off that that makes it, uh, makes it you know, makes learning fun. Um, and, you know, if you're not prepared to try things and fail, 
don't expect your students to. All right, thank you, Lou. Now, you've heard from each of the panellists. You've heard from their experience. I think we have a, a wide range of experiences and viewpoints about education. So now it opens up to you. We actually get to hear your questions and you get to grill the panel up the front for a bit of a change. Um, so just a reminder of how to ask questions. Um, I'll get the ball rolling initially, but you can either raise your hand and ask, or you can follow that link or Jack's QR code. He said, get a QR code, not just the link. But he did say, make sure you plug that I put the QR code up there. <laughs> so there you go, Jack, that's your plug. So you'll get the live forum and I'm getting questions through here. So keep asking away. I think that's the best. So I'll get the ball rolling. So panel, initially, um, when I was looking into what to ask, in the news, there's been a, a lot of talk about mobile phones in the classroom. Some schools um, are quite, quote unquote, progressive and use them in their pedagogy. Adam's putting his down right now. <laughs> Other schools have banned them completely. They're not in the classroom. From your school's point of view and from your own point of view as well, what is your opinion on ICT and things such as mobile phones in the classroom? And what advice could you give to a young teacher about implementing those type of things in the correct way in the classroom? It seems we're in an impasse with ICT, really going one way or the other. Louis, in your, in your school, um, I know you talk about emotional development with students and I've heard lots of studies that um, ICT use with such as things as iPads and mobile phones can even stunt emotional development with kids. What's your viewpoint on using ICT in a school like Maradati? If you want to grab the microphone as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question and um, certainly something we talk a lot about in this space. Firstly, I get really excited about technology and, and what it offers, particularly in a school like ours, which is more arts, arts has an arts focus. Um, well, firstly, children don't bring phones. Uh, it hasn't really become an issue. Technology-wise, we make sure that we have a availability of technology, but not one-on-one. -on -one. So one to six, you know, one to eight. We think that uh, we set them up so there's no gimmicky gadgets on them. They can only be used for filming, for taking images, for making music, so and for recording um, their own learning experiences. And so there's no distraction. It's more collaborative. Um, and the other thing that we find increasingly, if children are quite excited and connected and in our space because they can pursue interests and fascinations, the last thing they're really wanting to do is, you know, escape into technology. I think that's a relevant or quite relevant in lots of spaces. And we certainly have parents arrive with some concerns because technology is freely available. But same thing, I, we find that by choice and freedom and children are making decisions daily about how they want their learning to look. It, it, technology in our space supports it, but we make conscious decisions to restrict it. Adam, what's your views on mobile phones and the way you use it with your students? Uh, so uh, I use it at year 10 geography level. So uh, I use Google Classroom. So it's um, I think I'm the only teacher in the school that uses Google Classroom. I'm a big fan of it. There's a little things obviously they can tinker with and make it better. But um, I, I saw it from a um, I was seeing boys, once they get to about year nine, they just become really distracted with phones. They'll do the cheeky look in the pocket. Um, you know, they'll try and use it. They'll want to go to the toilet. They'll use it when they go to the toilet in those two minutes and come back again. They're just really addicted to it. And I said, well, if, if you're that addicted to it, let's use it. So they enrolled in Google Classroom. I put the course on Google Classroom. They submit work through it. I mark through it. They get their results back through it. But I also then drag those results into our own whole school database so i'm not bucking any trends there I, the school collects the data that they need but to engage the boys um, with their phones we do that we might go down uh, to the tuong creek and do some field work i might set them a task take a selfie next to a creek or a river in your own time and post it onto google classroom and a week later they've got these weird and wonderful <laughs> photographs of themselves next to the brisbane river <laughs> Um, and look, at the end of the day, if we're out in the class, if we're out in the field and we're doing something outside and, and a kid has a cheeky look at his text messages, well, whatever, I'm, I'm not fussed about that, but you're engaged in 
what task I've set you and to be honest they kind of forget about that stuff and they don't want to try and do the sneaky and try and look at the phone so that's the way I engage year tens uh, year nines it's not as bad uh, year eights it really doesn't come into play too much in my classrooms with phones in pockets mm. and coming out um, but year, year nines it starts to drift that way with phones um, yeah, yeah. Lou, I saw yourself laugh, laugh into the air enthusiastically when I mentioned mobile phones. As a leader of a school, what's your viewpoint on using ICT in the classroom? Um, I've been an early adopter. Um, been an early adopter since. Um, well, let me go back when I bought my first computer, personal computer, back in the uh, late eighties, early nineties, and so I've used it myself. Um, consistently in my work. In the college we have a differentiated policy obviously because we have preppies right through to 18 year olds in year 12. Um, in our sub schools we have different policies but I remember um, you know in mid 2000s when um, smartphones were starting to become the norm we actually and I was at um, Woodcrest State College at the time out at Springfield and we actually um, compulsorily included the use of mobile phones in assessment pieces and made the kids use them and use them responsibly and all of a sudden it took away the the us versus them mentality uh, the students use them for their learning their thousand dollar computer the computers sit in their pocket why would we um, exclude them from learning the challenge was to make sure that we could involve them in the learning process to add value like any um, electronic um, aid we use, uh, they're not the be-all and end-all, but they are. They do add value or can add value to the process. So we went from having boys in Year Nine hospitality who rarely submitted assessment to 95% completion rates because we made them use their mobile phone. Scott, I've I've uh, spent some time at TSAC and I've seen um, teachers within your department have a phone bucket at the front uh, door. And the uh, the students have to put their phones in the beginning of class. And they don't get it to the end. Do you disagree with what the other panelists have said? Not at all. I think actually there's a place for it. I think look, it comes back to the idea of what you said about formative work. All right. So the traditional way of measuring intelligence is starting to not fall by the wayside, but people are starting to become more aware of the fact that there's more than one way of measuring progress. So we do have a phone bucket still, or a phone box in my case. But very often I'll say to the kids, come and get your phones during the lesson because it might be that we're doing something that actually lends itself. So a good example would be in year eight, we actually do um, satire as well. So we've been doing satirical clips and, and creating our own clips and stuff like that and editing them and, and working on exactly what it is, you know, the choice of language, bringing English alive a little bit. It's good. It's a good idea to do that because suddenly you get students who are quite reluctant to read or to engage who are flying. So, you know, to use a coaching analogy, you don't score any shots that you don't take. You know what I mean? You, you need to be giving them the opportunity to, to use technology they're very comfortable with and that perhaps we're less comfortable with. So with some of the more reactionary um, educators who don't want to use mobile phones, I'll put it back on them and say, well, why? You know, is it that you're not comfortable, you mean? That would be my question. We can talk about addiction all day, but the honest truth is human behavior is always the, the driver. Like. We talk about social media policies at school. I'm sure you've got one. Um, very often it's human error. You know, it's human error with driving. It's human error. With, I'm, I'm addicted to tea. Does that mean I shouldn't be drinking tea anymore? You know what I mean, you know, we can all talk about addiction all day long. That's actually not the point. The point is about opportunity and giving them some kind of formative ability to, to think their way through a problem or to address an inquiry. Does anyone want to be very brave and raise their hand and ask a question, show your face and network with the panel in front of you? Yes. Hi. Um, I have a question for Elizabeth. Um, as a prac student who's had a few practicum experiences, the mental teachers that I've had have asked me multiple times, it's not too late, are you sure you want to become a teacher? <laughs> they've, they've already like disarmed me from the, the like optimism that I bring, like that I feel like I bring to the classroom. Uh, how do you find the uh, teacher uh, like uh, the atmosphere in the staff room and has it affected you in the past few years, would you say? 
I think I've been very spoiled in the fact that I work with some really, really good people. But also, I had to seek those people out actively. So it might come to the point where you need to start almost expanding who you're liaising with at school and looking a little bit further. And that is a shame that they're bringing that negative spin to your prac. If you find, though, that you can't really find a teacher who's, you know, kind of on your same level with positivity, I used to just go back to people in my cohort and also ask yourself why those teachers at that school might be in that negative headspace. But I think, yeah, maybe just trying to have a look a little bit further. Again, like I said before, you probably have some resources that maybe other teachers might like or ask for some feedback or something like that. And no matter what, you can usually find someone who's still got <laughs> a little bit of hope for you. <laughs> Yes, um, it's interesting um, in the college with the processes we have in place to support the uh, the prac students and also the Techie Teacher Education Centre for Excellence students. Um, we now have more staff volunteering to take prac students than we can provide now. So we had seventy five staff volunteer to take prac students this semester, um, and my director of the Techie said, you know, said went to QUT and said, look send us as many as you can. We, we've got more than we need. Um, so yeah, that's a really sad story and sad for those people um, that they, they feel that way about it. Uh, you know, I wonder who's going to teach their children if they're disincentivizing you. But I know our lived experience at the college is very different to that. Um, but that's because of the quality of the program we've put around our prac students and, and uh, and our mentor teachers around making sure that it's positive for everyone and people are lining up to be involved. I'm going to hit up the forum now. This is a question to Melinda. Um, you talked uh, a bit before about evidence-based teaching and using um, statistics and data. Um, this question is, how do we not get too bogged down as a teacher in a, a growing um, culture of standardization and normalization how do we still become that teacher that we wanted to be without getting too bogged down in content or making sure that we just hit the numbers when we need to? Um, when I was working with the assessment um, policies that we're putting in place in our school, um, my mantra to all the staff all the time was, it's just a test. And it's a snapshot of what that child can do on that day. And it's just a little bit of an insight, but it needs to be matched with your teacher judgment you have the best experience and expertise to be able to say what that child can or can't do. So when we started looking at an assessment program that went from preppies right through to A-levels, um, we wanted to have some sort of assessment that was very authentic. Um, we we're very lucky to marry up with um, Durham University um, and they had a lot of evidence-based assessment um, modules and um, facilities that we could use um, and we worked closely with Durham University and uh, we used computer adaptive models um, that uh, took into consideration different cultures, um, gender, um, lots of different factors that children bring with them to the classroom. But as we were assessing we were always mindful of the fact that this was just a test um, and so when we looked at the results, we were very careful about that. Um, and we did a lot of collaborating around the results. We worked within one-to-one uh, -one with teachers. I worked um, in year-level cohorts and I worked um, with whole school um, communities talking about results on a one-to-one -one level, um, in a year group level, and also what, what's happening across the whole school. And then we would look back at what we wanted to achieve as a school um, and what's our ethos and we would try and match what we were doing with the school ethos. So that was always very much the core of what we're doing. Even though we were using these assessment tools, we were only using it as a tool. Um, and also, um, this was within the UK, so very much, um, UK is very much driven by data. So we had regulations to fulfil, we would be inspected, we had to show that the children were progressing. But we matched it to the school's ethos, the vision that we had within the school, and we worked very closely with the leaders of the school. What do we want to achieve? What do we want these children to learn? How do we want them to be? What's their well-being? And then we worked from there. So, Louis, with Maradati, um, what role does assessment play in your school? Because I know um, with the growing culture of standardisation and assessments and testing going to younger and younger kids, 
I'm assuming as a leader of your school, be quite hard to resist those pressures. So what what do you believe about the assessment culture and what role does assessment play in Maradati? If you want to grab that microphone as well, please. I've got quite a loud mouth. Um, look, it's, it's complex and I guess, and again, I, I don't know anything about what happens in these spaces, but when I hear that, I hear a lot of rhetoric. I hear a lot of talk. I hear adults who adults who dictate and who do not bring children along with them. So, and in our space, it's more about, and when we see children increasingly, it's not what the adults actually know about them or think they know about this child. It's the meaning the child makes about themselves in these early years that they actually take with them. And so, you know, how the culture of learning is, is, is quite important in those early years. Um, at Maradati, no, parents consciously choose to withdraw from that plan so we don't have the standardization. But in, on the other side, we have a lot of pressure because the non-state schools accreditation board, in order to get accreditation and, and to actually, you know, get state and federal funding, we need to be able to show and, and share the stories of our children's learning. So how we choose to do it is very different than, than most schools. Are we doing it right? Well, I mean, I, mean, I, I just think it, it, it's exciting that we're playing. So we end up with really quite detailed documents produced by children themselves who participate in, in, in sharing what they do well, what they don't do so well. Parents participate and contribute to the conversation. Um, and then teachers, it's not an assessment. It's a documented, um, you know, we create documentation which tracks students' learning, where we make links to the curriculum because, you know, uh, this idea that ch when children choose, somehow that, that that's this, this little fairy tale, you know, that, that, that's not real, when actually we see that children, when they're consciously involved in the decisions about their learning, are really excited and can keep it really quite real. And the thing that when we talk about emotion is that when children are taken on that journey, they can actually say, well, actually, I do this really well. I like that, but I suck at that. But meaning, most children, if you can't do something in the current climate of schools, often take it to mean there's something wrong with them. And so uh, the process for us is taking children along, walking with parents, but at the same time, ending up with, with a document which clearly tracks and, and talks about what this child looks like at a learner, if that helps. Yeah. Melinda, would you like to, the, to reply to that? And also, one question to you. Um, in this growing culture of testing and, and the way that you've administered it to your students, do you ever get students getting stressed about NAPLAN or feeling the type of feelings that Louis is talking about where they feel like it's all wrong and it's all about them? Um, I don't feel I have enough qualifications to um, comment on NAPLAN because I haven't had any direct experience with it recently in my career. Um, but, however, just to give you a bit more of a fuller picture, when we were using that assessment data before, we would match it with really innovative um, assessment um, uh, methods. So, for example, very similar to what was just described, we, the children created their own portfolios of their own work. They were in charge of it. They would comment on it. They would give their own feedback. So it was a lot of student agency involved in that process. So when I was describing before the assessment we used, that was just a very small part of a whole picture of what we did with those children. Um, and a lot of what we did is we asked the children, um, they they inputted basically into their portfolios. They chose their work. They commented. We gave them tools on how to evaluate um, and how to set goals for themselves. Then I'm talking really young children as well, and they rose to the challenge. And a lot of them would drive set their own. They would give really honest and raw feedback on their learning that, as a teacher, you would never give. Um, and they that would then um, move them forward in their learning journey. All right, we're going to hit up the uh, the forum once again. This question, I think I'll, I'll start off with Lou. You talked briefly about um, the well-being of your students. How do you ensure the well-being of your teachers? What steps do you put in place to make sure that teachers feel supported, especially teachers within the first few years of their careers? Um, we don't separate students and teachers' well-being in the college. It's... Um for us as a community to be effective, everyone's well-being has to be a, a paramount. Um, I think uh, Adam talked about work-life balance or work-life satisfaction. We um, we certainly are very protective around that. So 
you know, in the past four years, we had very formulaic meeting structures where, you know, everyone must meet for X number of hours a week and whether they were productive or otherwise, but, you know, we will do that because that's what we've done for years. Uh, and that's that um, movement from the default structure of schools into a, an innovative space around, well, how do we get the best out of our people? So we, we make sure we, um, and these are very mundane examples, but if we've got an agenda um, for our leadership team or an executive team or whatever that has two agenda items that can be held over until the following week, that meeting is cancelled and that time is given back to people and that includes staff meetings as well, but we have very few staff meetings because getting together our staff is, um, you know, what productive learning is done in that space unless it is very much a, a twilight and it is a, a, a guest speaker who is um, working on something that's uh, one of our explicit improvement agendas in the year. I'm not a believer in the flip top head type PD where everyone goes out and we flip their head, we pour something in, tip it over and off you go and, and you'll get a change in practice. It just doesn't work. So our system's got to be a little bit more mature around how we go about le professional learning and everyone learns in different styles and ways, etc. So we, we are quite specific in what we're trying to achieve and how we go about that and um, you know, we, we find that sending people out is it's like respite care. Um, often it's give them a day away and it's, it's certainly not, um, it's not something I experience in my current setting but in some of my past settings it was respite care. So um, we are very specific and targeted in how we do our PD um, for our staff to make sure that, um, that their, their, their balance is okay. Um, and, and you know, I will walk around the school and kick people out and say go home. We, we we have a um, we at the start of the year we had a neuroscientist come and speak to our our staff and um, he really challenged them around this notion of busy and so we and he said you know is busy productive or is busy just busy and people thrive on being busy because that's that's been historically rewarded in our workplace and. And yet if you look at well, what's the productive use of that two hours of busy time, that if you had been really focused and productive, you might have knocked it over in 15 minutes and you get out of here and go home to your family um, or your partner or your dog, whatever it is that gives you your balance. So we are really protective around that um, and we've changed the narrative in the college. If someone, I did that in my student free day presentation, taught, challenged them around productive versus busy and um, people now catch themselves. If you say, oh, How's your week been? Oh, really busy. Oh, um, yeah, so we're actually trying to change that thinking um, around use your time well and wisely. And, and Liz and I were talking about the, the, the urgent and important matrix. Um, you know, use that wisely around, well, okay, here's a task, but is it urgent and is it important? And if it's not, well, I'll ignore it. I'll just deal with the things that are up in that top right-hand quadrant and... Uh, and, and calm my farm around how I'm going and feel for the week. <laughs> um, Adam, I was going to uh, talk to you about also teacher well-being and um, Lou touched on work-life balance and, and busy work. Um, before you were talking about your work-life balance and your structures, that's a lot of that seemed to be self-imposed. Lou talked about some steps that he put in place in his schools. Do you believe schools don't put enough steps in place to ensure that their teachers don't get bogged down? Because a lot of your um, systems seem to be self-imposed and self-imposed rules. I hate email. So uh, <laughs> I got it off. It's one of the things you, when you step into a school, it's probably, probably take you six months to 12 months to work out uh, the, pol the political aspect of the school and you'll work out. And after 14 years at one school, I've kind of worked that out, hopefully. Um, I, I find things like email uh, a, a real burden on staff. They just, um, they're a morale killer. You, you've got to do one of two things, so or two things. So you've got to set yourself aside time during the day to look at emails. So I do that first thing in the morning when I get there about 7.30. Uh, to about quarter to eight and then that's done. The next time I check again is roughly period six of the day depending what classes I have. So it might be a tad bit earlier, a tad bit later. 
and see if there's anything else that I need to follow up on. And that's it. I turn it off. I turn Outlook off. The other thing is people getting um, trapped into putting um, Outlook on their phone, um, putting Outlook on their home computer or, or home laptop and looking at it on weekends. So you just got to turn away from that stuff. Give yourself time, morning, afternoon, check emails. Uh, the second thing is that create rules. Use the rule function in Outlook and create rules. Put people into deleted folders. Put people into their own folders. For instance, uh, Liam has got a folder on, on my computer. My head of department's got a folder. Um, some people have got the deleted folder because what they send is not critical for my job to do. And my job is to walk into a classroom and teach that class. So there's the difference between what's critical and what's not critical. And uh, an email about the, the, two, the critical emails I see each day is one, there's a room change. So if I need to move for whatever reason, exams for instance, um, and we need to move rooms, that's, that's critical for me for my teaching that morning. So when I see that email come through about room changes, I check it and I always check it. The second one is if I've got to cover a teacher who's away. So I had to cover someone in period two today. So when that email comes through, I check that email. So that, that person's email does not go into any deleted folders or anything. It pops up straight in front of me. So I got my, I've gotten my emails down to this morning. I had three emails to respond to. So one was the period two cover and the other two were from parents for a, a trip that we're doing next year uh, to Nepal for something that I organised with school. And there was two queries that came in. So within the next 12 to 24 hours, I need to respond to those. But email is not critical. That's what people have to get out of their head. If someone wants you for something, they would come and say, hey, Scott, I need you to do X. Or they would pick up the phone and say, hey, Scott, I need you to do X for me this afternoon. That's, that's when it starts to become critical in your day. Then you can work it out between the two of you what you need to do then. But me sending Scott an email saying, hey, mate, can you do this for me this afternoon? He might not look at it until tonight, tomorrow, you don't know. So it can't be critical if someone's emailing you. Um, so that, that's, yeah, so he's very self-imposed. I encourage a lot of people to probably do a bit of reading with uh, a guy called uh, Kel Newport. Kelvin Newport, he's a professor at Georgetown uh, University in the States. I drew a lot of my kind of inspiration from his books. Um, so he's probably someone you'd want to look at. He talks a lot about digital technology and how to minimise it and social media, how to minimise it and things like that. So it's a good one. Yeah, sure. As a general life hack, don't answer emails on a Sunday. Just gen gen I'm serious, don't, all right? Because the minute you raise that expectation that you reply on a Sunday, you're sucked in for life, okay? And I can tell you now, parents in schools, they love that because they know they can get to you on a Sunday, all right? You're opening up a Pandora's box for yourselves. I'm not saying don't talk to the parents. What I'm saying is leave it till Monday, all right? Answer within a certain time frame. So Adam's completely right. Give yourself a break. You've got to stand back from the job to really do your job well. It sounds paradoxical, but it works well. And eventually then your life will inform your work and your work will inform your life. All right? But little things like that are really important. You've got to have that time. My partner's at the back, so she's probably smiling at that one. But <laughs> to be fair, you do need to do that. I'm, I'm terrible for checking my phone every five minutes, but I've had to get out of that habit. You know, it's one of those things that if you raise that level of expectation, then... The minute you don't, that's when people go, why haven't you answered my email? Mm. I sent it 20 minutes ago. <laughs> that's right. We've had students at our school um, who've handed a draft into a teacher and three hours later gone back and said, why haven't you marked it yet? You know, that's got to be trained out of them. That's, that's not acceptable. You know what I mean? Does anyone want to raise their hand and ask a question in person? Yes. So we are in our final semester and so we're thinking about kind of starting next year and on, our, on my crack I've been very lucky to come into classrooms that already have a wonderful classroom culture, classroom environment, kind of the rules and procedures and respect is already kind of set up and I've been really lucky I can just like slip into their already created classroom culture. I was wondering what you guys do at the start of your year because I know we learn a lot but I just... There's so many different things being said, so I'd just love to hear like what you guys as like new teachers and experienced teachers do to like start your year and even like build rapport with students and kind of, I know like, I feel like they won't, you know, respect me or like I feel so close to their age. So just things like that, how do you kind of build that? You mentioned being close to their age, so I'll shove that uh, to Liz first. 
Liz, how do you set up your classroom before the year? Do you think about what type of kids you'll have to get your class list? Do you have a behavior management plan? Do you have your classroom like seating plan? Like what extents do you go to to set up your classroom before the year officially begins? That's a really good question, actually. Um, at BBC, we're lucky because we usually get to go on a camp. So obviously, that's a great icebreaker for the kids. But usually, I don't just start off with, um, this is what we're learning, okay, jump straight into it. Don't do that. Actually, just do some of the old school activities. Go around, ask the kids what they did on their holidays and take a mental note. Don't give them a seating plan. Check where they sit, where they want to sit. Because usually sometimes they're sitting with their friends or something like that. It could eventually down the track maybe become a little bit of a problem or they get a bit disruptive. So try and work out who's friends with who. Do a few little ice break activities. Look at their reports from the previous year as well. I find that can be very telling. Not so much grades, but just general comments from teachers. So if you have time or the luxury to know who you're teaching before the day, go back through. Um, if you've had any, if you know any of their teachers from your prac, if you get a job at your prac school, maybe just have a chat to them when they have time about a few of the kids. But rapport, as you all would know, isn't really something you can just make happen on day one. It takes a lot of effort. Um, my father's a teacher and the rule he always told me was don't smile before Easter. So you do really need to um, be quite firm with them, I suppose, and set those boundaries to begin with. But eventually, once they know you respect them and they respect you, the rapport will eventually happen. Scott, what steps do you put in place to prepare your year before the kids come rushing in day one? Um, I usually go in a couple of days before um, and just sort of get my head around one, one which classes I've got. Two, I, I, I'm actually, I completely ignore their previous year's work. I completely ignore it because I want to get a read on the student themselves. I don't need to be... This is where I agree with Louis on data. Sometimes, you know, numbers, they don't help you get to the actual person. So I actually get them to write me a letter. All right? I do. I get them to write me a letter. What do you want me to know about you? All right? I tell them a little bit about myself, obviously. But then I'll say, you know, what do you want me to know about you? And you open that question up. The boys generally are quite brief. They're like, yeah, I like soccer. Yeah. That's about it. That's, that's all you get. My favorite ice cream is chocolate. Thanks. Bye. But the girls might actually open up. Do you know I mean it's not always the case? Sometimes there's, there's you know differences. But what what you find is you know they will open up a little bit more. All right, and then you file away little details about them. You do look uh, uh, like you know like like it's just been said. I don't have a seating plan initially, but you can see who gravitates where pretty quick. You you develop an instinct, don't you? You know you can go right. Well, let's flip the classroom around. You come to the front. You come to the back. You just flip flip the back row to the front row. <laughs> that's always a good way front row to the back you know just play with it just explain to them that's not a permanent seat in the classroom this is my classroom this isn't yours all right and you just you just you say something without saying anything does that make sense so if you're not a confrontational person and generally that's not the best way to get through the kids anyway that's the best way to deal with it and just have just have a little session where you talk about what you like and what you expect your rules to be and then just model it all right just be consistent the most powerful thing you can do in any classroom is be consistent all right. The minute that they feel consistency, they feel safe, they'll open up, you'll get better work out of them. That's the best gift you can give them. Um, I'm going to... Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Oh, um, hello, my name's Sophie. I'm in my final semester as well. Um, one thing that um, I'm really interested in is just trialling different experiences within education, you know, rural, inner city, overseas. Um, but it's kind of hard to know whether you start in rural, whether you'll stay there for five years or, you know, if it is good to trial all of those things and then find out what sector maybe suits you best. And I know, Melinda, you worked overseas for a long time. And whether you just have any um, words of advice on how to kind of maybe structure how you go about that or whether you should trial everything or just some tips, I guess. <laughs> well, I just basically went where the door opened. Um, because when I graduated from my ad undergraduate degree here in Brisbane, um, there were no jobs. And literally you had to go further north than Mount Isa to get a job when I, it was um, early 1990s. Um, and so I ended up um, going into a childcare centre um, because I knew some people who had a centre and then um, the lady who was in charge of the centre left abruptly. Um, so I fell into the same situation where I then got put into the position of the centre director and I was fresh out of uni and the doors just kept opening. 
Um, and then I went from there um, and I wanted to get back into a school um, and I had heard about a school in Thailand that was looking for primary school teachers. And I guess for me, I have a sense of adventure. And I guess um, being a teacher, I like that in my classroom as well. And that's why I like being an early childhood teacher because you get a sense of adventure every day with children. But I um, knocked on a door in Thailand and the door opened and I went and taught there for a couple of years. Um, and then after that, I then had a real passion for literacy. So I wanted to come back to Queensland and I did a postgrad here at UQ. Um, and then another door opened in the independent sector here within Queensland. So I guess I kind of just followed, um, had one experience and from whatever I gained from that experience, I then sort of knocked on another door and then it opened. But I kind of um, was very similar to the other experience where I, I just put my CV out there and I didn't limit myself to what um, I would never have dreamt that I would go and teach in Thailand as um, a second year teacher, never ever. And that was before the internet and you couldn't even buy bread or milk. Um, I had no TV, no telephone, and I lived next to a rice paddy. And I remember flying in and um, the administrator of the school picked me up from the airport and put me in this house and said, there you go, I'll see you Monday morning. And I sat there going, what have I just done? Um, and I guess it's through those experiences that build you as a teacher as well, so that you can go into a classroom and when you're put in front of a challenging situation, um, you just kick yourself into a mode, you become, you're creative and you just draw upon your life experiences. So I, I wouldn't think too hard about it. I would just sort of knock on doors and see where that takes you. And then um, for me, I've really enjoyed literacy and teaching reading um, to young children. And then I came back a bit more study. Then I went back out into um, the workforce and that's how I ended up doing it. And, and when I went to the UK, it was because a friend of mine was teaching in the UK and she said, oh, they need a teacher. And they did a phone interview with me and it was at 3 a.m. in the morning. They'd forgotten there was a time difference between the UK and Australia. And I got phoned up at 3 a.m. in the morning, no joke. Um, and so I answered the phone and they started a full-on interview with me <laughs> and I woke up. So, and I don't know how I got the job, but I did. Um, and so my husband and I flew off to the UK and then I was there for a couple of years. And the head said, I see something in you. I want you to be in a leadership position. So there I stepped into the leadership position. So um, I didn't sort of um, actively go and map it out. Okay, in five years' time, I want to be here, here and here. It just happened. Lou, you've got a varied background with being leaders, a leader in different type of schools. What advice could you give? Yeah, the, um, the experiences just add to your repertoire. Um, the... The scenarios change since we were a little bit younger. So, if you're looking for a real remote experience, they'll offer you permanency because um, they struggle to fill their school quotas. By all means, do what Liz says. Go read the school newsletters. You'll get a feel for the place um, and, and a feel for the community. And um, you know, back to the point over here before around once you're in those communities, make the connections, and it's that fine balance. Um, you know, you guys are a little bit older. I just turned 20 when I started teaching and I had 18-year-olds in my classroom and we were going to the same nightclubs in, in the, the, you know, the little country towns, which was fraught with danger. Um, but, you know, in this day and age, there is such a need and, you know, my sister was principal in Mount Isa for 14 years. She would start most years with four and five positions not filled. Um, you go to Ipswich and they can't fill their positions. It's bizarre. So um, you guys are in the opportunity of, of picking and choosing. Um, do you do a city experience first, then go country? Um, you know, I've got a lot of young first, second and third years in the college. I incentivise that by offering them boomerang transfers. So I give them that two or three years of really good grounding. Then I say, now off you go. Um, do your three-year experience. One student, one teacher came to me and said, look, I, I, I want a country experience. My wife and my three girls... I've been here for five years. Uh, he's a maths teacher. You know, how hard was it to place him in the country? I just rang my brother in Mackay, his principal in Mackay. I said, do you want a great maths teacher? Quality assured for three years, then I'll get him back. And he said, oh, let me think about that, yes. Uh, so um, he's got it getting that experience and it's highly unlikely he'll actually come back. He'll get a hot job um, because he's a really good operator. But um, there's, different, there's, there's no one magic formula around it but um, the opportunities are out there in every sector um, around Queensland Queensland's going to New South Wales and Victoria trying to pinch their teachers we're, we're trying to work overseas um, there's just a massive shortage so 
um, one of my music teachers has just got a job in Dubai. Um, and, you know, that's a, an amazing experience for her too. So, um, yeah, it's you guys, are you own the market. I'll hit up the forum again. This question's, uh, I'll start off with Louis. Um, when I've been uh, at schools, I've seen the way that they've done streaming quite um, differently. I've seen um, people just go, nut, this is just a random assorted class. These are just your kids. Get on with it. I've seen um, schools where they they stream by ability. In an extreme case, I saw a school stream classes by race because there were so many cultures within the schools, they didn't appreciate cultural difference initially. And they put all the African kids, they went, these are the African kids. Yeah, they didn't acknowledge that there's different tribes and different groups within those kids and some of them have quite bitter rivalries. So the only way they could get any sort of normal classroom was to separate it by race. And that was in an extreme low socioeconomic school that I saw. At Maradadi, what do you do in terms of streaming and what do you believe about streaming by saying this kid, uh, pigeonholing a kid as this is their ability, we'll put them all with the, the other sick puppies, so to speak? Or do you think that's an, an effective way to stream or what's your views on that topic? Uh, look, I'll just speak to the work we do. I mean, it probably addresses the well-being. I think I, someone else was talking about how do we support beginning teachers. So the way Maradati set up, we have all multi-age except a kindy single stream and so is PrEP. We use PrEP as a sort of transition space. And so we're building up these sort of hubs of children who, you know, who are in a space for three years and then move into a new space. Um, so it's, it's, it, it feels it, it's supportive in terms of a child that has pre-established relationships, potentially they have siblings in the same space. Um, in terms of a beginning teacher, we do a team approach, so there's never one teacher in one space. So we have um, two teachers who share, plus supportive support staff. We have a maximum of 12 to 15 children in one space. Each, um, each teacher has a support staff, an, an extra adult. If we have difference, we add another adult. Um, so it, it's really a culture where we're, we're looking to support rather than actually make judgments around. I mean, in terms of difference, it's probably one of our biggest challenges. In, uh, I think people uh, certainly are drawn to somewhere like Maradati because uh, you know, I would challenge that I, I don't think schools, well, maybe, again, I'm, I'm speaking generally. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not speaking to any of what that these people do. but. Difference traditionally hasn't been supported well. It's quite, it, it's a fearful thing. And, and it's not because people don't want to help. It's often there isn't the support or they don't know how. Um, so we certainly make sure that I guess the difference is, is equally represented in spaces. Um, but um, yeah, look, it, it's not an issue for us. It's certainly something we, you know, it, it, it just doesn't fit with what we do. We probably don't have the numbers. As we move to Brisbane and Ipswich, there's certainly a lot of pressure for high schools. But again, um, the idea of streaming is just a, a way out of my reality, really. Scott, you've had experience in schools where they've streamed and they haven't streamed. I'm sure you've had the high-end class and then maybe the learning difficulties class. Does your pedagogy change when you get kids of those um, different abilities? And do you agree with it in a con as a concept? I think streaming's got to die. <laughs> it's that simple, right? I'm not a fan. And the reason I'm saying that is when I started my career, we literally did stream one, two, three, four, five. I mean, even, even back when we were very young in England, we had the 11 plus exam. So we took an exam and at 11, you got streamed into grammar school or, or higher, you know, higher opportunities in private schools, or you went to secondary modern and you did a trade at 11, all right? That is a ridiculous way to run a child's life on rails. Um, your pedagogy doesn't change in terms of the fact that you're still trying to educate the individual, all right? So that's the first thing. The way you address the subject, like if you're doing a Shakespeare play is a good example in English probably. If you're approaching it with a mixed classroom, you have to think about tiered questioning that's going to appeal to all levels, right? You're going to get a, a range of responses. So the, one of the things with a new system, which is interesting, is any instrument that we use to assess in the senior courses has to be valid enough that it allows an A to E response. You know what I mean? So that goes back to your pedagogy. You look at it and go, the outcome isn't what you focus on, all right? You're going to get A, B, C, D, E in the classroom if you want to measure it that way. 
if that's the way you choose to measure a classroom, that's not the way I choose to measure my classroom. All right, we look at incremental improvement. Do you know what I mean? So you get a child who's a reluctant reader and suddenly they pick it up and they actually want to engage with it, that's incremental improvement. You know, they start to gradually get better, incremental improvement. You keep improving over that course of time that Lou's referred to there, they become superb students. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a given. Uh, the next question in the forum uh, talks about autonomy within teaching. And Lou, I'll direct this to you. As a leader of a school, you get a very big picture view on where you're going, where you're heading as a school. How much do you have to toe the line between having a standardized approach pedagogically and also valuing each teacher and your staff as an individual professional that can make their own choices in a classroom? Where's the balance between giving teachers autonomy and having an overall school focus? We have, a, um, we have in the college a, a pedagogical approach which is um, it's called the gradual release of responsibility. It's a Fisher and Frey approach where um, it, it's the overarching approach but, but we don't prescribe within any classroom um, how that teacher, whether it's linear, whether they're uh, moving all around, it, you know, that's a nonsense because from day to day in, in the same class their readiness, their connectedness, their ability to run free and, and work really well in the collaborative or independent learning space might depend on whether it's a full moon, whether it's blowing, you know, all these sorts of things that are the variables that exist when you put 30 or 28 completely different individuals in a classroom with a teacher. So we have a common language around the approach to teaching but there is absolutely no prescription around that. Um, we have a fantastic collegial um, conversation process where our staff are in and out of class, each other's classrooms all the time. That um, overflows into the staff rooms, it overflows into collegial cafes that we have after school where people share best practice or great practice or just um, an interest in a topic. So uh, I've got, you know, 240 really clever people why would I be prescribing to them that you all must we're not robots, the kids in front of them aren't robots so it's responsive to the students who sit in front of them Scott, you've had experience in schools where you've had more free reign and then I've seen schools where it's almost minute by minute where every teacher in the department is teaching the same lesson at the same time and it's almost like 3, 2, 1 alright, go you've seen the extremes of autonomy and then schools where there's no autonomy as well. What do you believe about teacher autonomy and as a teacher do you feel you have autonomy to make decisions as they arise in your own classroom? I think that there's a, such a thing as a framework. So you have a rough framework that you work, you work around but how you approach that, that's, that should be your call all right, in the classroom. So as long as you can justify any decision you make or you're accountable for the decisions you make, then I think it's okay. You know what I mean? So the honest truth is we are professionals, all right? We are professionals, all right? And we are therefore held to a professional standard. It's how you conduct yourself as a professional that's the key thing here. Now, I've seen, I've seen, and I've had heads of faculty that are less secure with that freedom, and I've had heads of faculty that are very much free reign, do what you like. Both extremes can be dangerous. I think you need to have some form of framework or, or check and balance, and that's only right for the students. At the same stage, trying to prescribe things minute by minute is, is you're just going to strangle everything. Nothing can function at that point. So you have to be allowed to approach. I'll give you an example again with Shakespeare. If you look at Shakespeare, there's various different versions of, say, Romeo and Juliet that exist. If you're going to use a film version of Romeo and Juliet, do you use the DiCaprio version, which is the modernized one with the, with the older language? Do you use the Rand, which is the classical version? That's, that's going to be your personal choice or taste. You know, that's like trying to prescribe everyone should like cheddar cheese. Well, Perhaps I don't. Perhaps I'm lactose intolerant. You know, you've got to allow for individual difference. Um, but you just need, you do need to be accountable for the decisions you make, but within reason. That'd be my answer. Um, question in the forum. Uh, I'll direct this one to Elizabeth. Um, when you're going out and trying to find schools, sometimes I know uh, the schools that I had practice. There just wasn't any placements in my internship. 
I know uni was saying, make sure you nail the internship because most often than not, you'll get a job offer. It just didn't seem to, they were going in another direction. There wasn't a vacancy and I was just pushed into the pond basically um, without any floaties. And I didn't know where to go for jobs, when to apply, how to apply, um, whether to go through Seek or LinkedIn or uh, network or just cold call people out of the blue. How do you present yourself as a young teacher and how do you get the best employment opportunities in that silly season kind of term three-ish, term four-ish kind of area? How do you present yourself the best and how do you get your foot in a school that may potentially be hiring? This is only my personal experience. Other people might have different ways. They approach jobs. LinkedIn is your absolute best friend. Uh, LinkedIn's fantastic um, because uh, more often than not, your employer will go straight there. Another thing is having just a really clear, simple cover letter that actually speaks to the school's values and codes and their ethos as well. And this is going to sound silly, again, common sense, but please proofread. Like again and again and get everyone you know to proofread your cover letter. The amount of times I've seen HR, I've honestly seen this happen, have a look at someone's cover letter, there's a spelling mistake on it, just throw it out. It happens. You're stressed, you might be applying for jobs. I remember applying for jobs around the same time exams were, the end of semester too, so your brain's everywhere. Don't, do, don't have silly little mistakes. And as I said in my opening little spiel as well, email HR of all the schools. Seek is fantastic, but read it really carefully. Read their job description. Um, some places only want you to apply through Seek. Others say just respond via email. So make sure you do what they ask you to do as well. Uh, calling schools is okay, but you need to be very careful about how you do it. Um, make sure you call, obviously, the front office first is the best way to go and say, you know, I'd like to apply. Whereabouts would you like me to direct my resume? Um, I would be wary of just turning up with a resume as well sometimes, especially um, during, you know, the end of school year when it's very busy. Just be mindful of how you present yourself and how you actually contact the school and what's appropriate. That yeah, answers your question. <laughs> talking about um, checking your resume, I heard of a horror story where someone thought they'd be quite smart and make like an algorithm for their resume where they could just click the different schools and have a different type of uh, resume that they could all send out at once. Needless to say, the algorithm didn't work. And what came through was, it's always been my passion to work at BBC, Brisbane Grammar, Churchy. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all the schools they put in the algorithm at once. Can I also add, check your Facebook page. Because if you haven't got that as private, it's, it's your right to post whatever you want on your Facebook page. But just be aware that that represents who you are. And um, if you think that people don't check it, you're kidding yourself. <laughs> Scott, you have a comment? Please learn from Israel Falay. All right? Social media is not your friend at times. And you've got to be very, very careful. We, I mean, this is the very first thing that gets looked at. All right? Any, any employer worth their sort is going to look at your social media. That's just a fact. All right? And use your prac. If you're on a prac in a school that you really like, use that as an extended interview. You know what I mean? Look at it and go, that's a six-week interview, essentially. All right? Schools are notoriously. If they've got someone on the books already they like, that's good. All right? Yeah. Sorry. We've that got time for one more question. Yeah, that, that was very old school. I'm sorry. Um, I'm an old person, so check your Insta. Um, you know, whatever you are using. Um, just from a, from a state school point of view, the Teach Queensland site is um, the place to sort of make your links through. But, but you're... Scott's right, as far as your, your practicums and internships, if they're still existing, are absolutely um, your best trial in the school and Brisbane schools use that extensively. Um, if you want, and it's probably for you guys, it'd be fourth years, it's probably too late, but if you want a country practicum experience or a beyond the range grant so you can actually be funded to go. Uh, my son drove to and from Tully twice for prac and internship in his fourth year, um, but he knew he was He'd already been appointed in March of his fourth year um, to Tully for the following year. So he knew he was going to the school where he was doing his Bracken internship and he was going to be teaching the following year. So um, the Teacher Queensland site is certainly um, a place you need to be connecting through. Um, that process they're making offers now. All of our techies, our 82 techies, all know exactly where they're teaching next year. We've got time for one more question. So what we're going to be doing is 
each panelist is going to have about 30 seconds to give their view on this one particular question. Now, in my research for this, I saw that 52% of teachers within their first five years of their career drop out of the profession. And that's linked with another stat that said only 50% of university students within the education faculty graduate. So put those two together, only around 25% of people that start the journey of education stay with it long term. What can an early career teacher do to make sure that they're part of that 25% and what can they do to support themselves long term and stay within the education profession? Louis, would you like to start with that one? And then we'll go down the line, only about 30 seconds each. Okay. Look, I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask. I don't necessarily agree with all of those things that people are saying. Obviously, it depends on you as a person and what you're looking for. Don't believe everything you read on the website. The best chance and the best opportunity you have is to read what a school is like is to walk in the door. And I don't mean without an appointment. Whatever, to try to get in, sense the culture. Because I tell you, in education, there's a lot of this. And it rarely translates to looking like that in action. They talk about universities and what with their teaching in unis and how schools look. Lots of schools are lost in the dark ages. I'm saying if it's something you love and it's really important to you and you're driven by it, find the place or the space that's going to best align with you. Now, I know that's probably a, you know, I, ideal when most of you have had no money for four years and you really want to get out and be independent. But make that choice wisely. Give yourself time to find somewhere that's like-minded and relates. And I don't mind a spelling mistake occasionally because to me it feels a bit more real, just saying. Liz? It's a really good question. I think the best thing you can do, again, I'm all about the support network, creating one for yourself. Cut yourself some slack as well. I was really harsh on myself for probably the first, well, right up until now. I've been very, very harsh on myself <laughs> with my teaching. But you just need to tell yourself it's going to be okay. Everyone messes up. What you notice that you mess up, your students don't even pick up on it sometimes. You're lucky if they're paying that much attention to you. So just try and relax a little bit would be my advice. Scott, be honest with yourself. All right? Be honest with yourself. Why are you going into teaching? You've got to ask yourself that question. All right? If you know why, you know it's not a job. All right? This isn't a job. It's a calling. You're called to it. All right? And it's one of those things, as you were talking about, the, the teachers are trying to put you off. If you get put off by that, you shouldn't be teaching. That's my answer. No, I know you wouldn't I know you wouldn't have been, but what I'm saying is people who get put off by that shouldn't be there. All right? And you know why. Instinctively or you don't. All right? And it's about having that, that determination. You've got to be determined. You've got to be determined to find the right environment for yourself. You've got to be determined to do the best by the kids. And um, that's why we're all there. That's why we're there. Adam? It, it's about creating a really good support network for yourself. Um, you know, Liz came in. Liz actually sits about this far away from me in the staff room. We, our desks are next to each other, and she's a roller coaster ride every day. And uh, <laughs> her emotions, er, everything's wild. So, but but for for both of us, we um you know creating really good friendships in the staff room. Uh, like another colleague, Dan, he's here as well today. And Dan and I travelled last year to Tanzania together as part of a school trip and you know it, things like that cement and bond and, and firm a lot of things and you guys will walk in as, as the young teachers of, of the group but you know I think there's about 17 years difference between Liz and I but we can talk about the same bad 90s pop music and play stuff on YouTube while we've got spare periods so it's all about building that network of, of friends and support mm. around you within the staff room. Melinda? Um, my key word would be collaboration. Just make sure you collaborate with everyone around you. And yes, there will be people who won't want to co collaborate with you and they'll want to stay in their classrooms. But find those people who do and talk with them. And if you've had a rough lesson, go and talk with them and have a space where you can debrief or even talk to your cat when you get home. Or, and make sure that you are making those links with people and you are getting out of your classroom. And if you're lucky to be in a school that's very innovative and has open and flexible learning places, that's even better because you get to watch and observe and see what everyone does and you pick up little bits and pieces. Even myself, after 25 years, I'm still learning, I'm still growing. Lou? Um, all of that, um, but understand that on any given day, if you've got five classes, 
you've been exposed to 150 different variations and variables that you cannot control. And you beat yourself up for the first two or three years, and I have this conversation regularly with my son, oh, that lesson didn't go so well. Why? There are so many variables that you don't control in that, that teaching space. You're there being the best you can be. And, and if you can look at yourself at the end of every lesson and go, well, I gave that the best shot. What have I, what have I learned? How can I be better? And move on. But stop self-flagellating because otherwise you just get a very sore arm. Um, you know, it's, it's a complex calling that we go into and the students, you can't control so much of that stuff. And I've worked in very low SES schools and I've worked in really high SES schools. They're all complex. So, uh, you know, just hang on. The collaborations, the network, the support, and just you know, just enjoy the ride. It is. I've been doing it 35 years. I love it. So thank you very much for coming to this event. The panelists will be hanging around for a little bit outside in the foyer kind of area. If you would like to ask that question, you didn't get to ask so far. To keep up with Pracky, we're doing symposiums all the time. The best way is to go to www.pracky.com. It's on that sheet that I gave you at the very beginning. And we have our mailing list sign up on the very front page. That's literally what, you, what it looks like as you sign in. And then you can keep up to date. Also, updates would be on our Facebook page, which is just slash Pracky Productions without the hyphen. Make sure you like that and keep up to date with what we're doing. Can we give a big round of applause to the panelists that came in? We'll be around to ask questions, but other than that, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Child, my world. Can't you see clearly?